And welcome to another edition of the show, where tonight we're going to touch on something that is front and center as far as the uh, media world, the political world, but something that's been ongoing for a very long time in this country. Uh, my name is Son Edom. I am a host of the uh, Two Steps Ed podcast, and I am joined here in studio with uh, Daniel West, who is the host of the Informal Program podcast. And on the phone, we've got uh, Brandon Wade, who is the host of Pay It Forward podcast. And so the three of us have come together, and we're going to talk about some issues that are affecting us here in this country today. And, and uh, that main topic is race. And again, just starting the dialogue, will we get to answers? Will we be able to solve the problems? Uh, we don't know. Maybe not, but at least we get the conversation started. And, and Daniel, I'll start with you first. Um, one of the things that has kind of led to some diversion or maybe some, uh, some issues with uh, diversity and what we address each other is kind of, I don't want to say labels, but, but it is. You know, you've got people that say we should, that people should refer to black people as African-American or that we should refer to them as black people or we should refer to them as people of color. So what are you? Ooh, well, legitimately, like literally in that sense, I am African-American. My grandfather on my mom's side is from Nigeria. So I can say like African-American growing up. That's pretty much like all that I would refer to myself as. As I get older, black is a term that, that I use more. And the older I get as well, I kind of don't have much of an issue with either one, to be honest with you. Um, in some ways, it's it, it's a little bit PC in terms of like, which one do I say? But I'm totally fine with it. Yeah, I'm, I'm a black guy. Uh, so if someone comes up to you and says, uh, this is Daniel West, he's a black guy, you're okay with that? Yeah. Someone comes up and says, this is Daniel West, he's uh, African-American, you're okay with that? Yeah. What about people of color? Um, is that just too much of a general I, reference, you think? Yeah I, th- yeah, I think when it comes to that one, that wouldn't necessarily be used conversationally, at least. It's a little bit more kind of like a broad way of describing people. So, I mean, I am a person of color, yes. Um, but usually it would, it would be a little odd in terms of just like a social sense talking about it. But, you know, it's okay. So for you, either way, either black or African-American is okay. Uh, Brandon, what about you again? Brandon Wade joining us via the telephone. And so, Brandon, uh, what yeah. about you? Uh, we talk about uh, black people, African-American people, people of color. Is there anything... Uh, as far as what people address you as that you prefer, don't prefer, think is racist, things like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I came from, you know, where I've had plenty of different experiences in life. Um, I was a uh, middle-class kid or sort of a lower middle-class kid growing up in Los Angeles, you know, so I've been in the hood, you know, I've been in the, I've been on the wealthier side, of the, you know, the wealthiest side of life in town. So in, in my instance, I've been in a lot of places where uh, the black person was the minority. And to me, um, being referred to as a person of color, a black man, African-American, really I think it's more or less about the intent behind it or the derogatory, or whether the, the reference is just simply a positive reference or um, a reference that the intent may not be the same. So I would say... Not it doesn't really bother me. Uh, pretty much um, all of them are good. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not particularly bothered that much by it. Um, it's more or less you know what what the intention behind it would be is an attempt to create uh, uh, a toxic separation. Is it an intent to create just uh, identify someone of another race? Because I mean I am a black person, I am a person of color, and I am African American, so I don't particularly see any reason why that would bother me and I identify with all of those. It's, it's more or less about intent more than anything else. Yeah, now on your podcast, you talk about, uh, you say I'm Brandon Wade, you can call me whatever you want as long as you're nice. Yep. And, and you made the reference yep. intent, I guess intent <laughs> yeah. too, Daniel. I yeah. guess that's kind of the point. As long as the intention yeah. isn't one of racist or of negativity, you know, um, I guess then how you refer to somebody is actually the intent behind it is what's important. Yeah, and, and people might say African-American to be sensitive that, oh, maybe he doesn't want to be called black, maybe he does it, whatever. So I think that that is a good point that Brandon makes. Is it is a heart thing in terms of why are you saying that? And wherever people are coming from on that, I'm cool with it as long as it isn't derogatory. Now, the other thing, too, I thought as we start out here, as we uh, have kind of set the tone for, you know, not labels, but, you know, again, that is kind of one of the big things people will deem racist depending on how you refer to somebody. And like I said, 
uh, like you referred to, uh, the intent there. What about as far as just kind of generally talking about some of the issues of racism that you've experienced? Because you're both roughly young guys, and so about the same age, give or take, a few years maybe. Um, and so, Daniel, we'll start with you. Maybe if you can kind of just share some of the, uh, the racism that you've experienced, if any, and kind of how your life has gone as uh, being a young black man. Sure. For, for me, and, and I, I don't know how close Brandon and I are in terms of this, but, you know, in terms of where I grew up, I didn't experience a lot. But I think what my journey was is kind of realizing what I look like to other people because – when I interacted, yeah. I never really thought about, oh, I'm a black guy. Oh, I'm, I didn't, I don't yeah. really, even now, I don't really see myself as a race. And that's not in a bad way. It's just like, I see myself as Daniel. And I know what I think in terms of like how I look like, but it's more emotions. It's more actions. So for me, it wasn't so much racism as the idea that this is who I am. And what does that mean? What does it mean to be black? And to kind of realize there are to be aware of racism, even though I haven't necessarily outwardly experienced it in those ways, but to be aware and to be wise that even though I don't see myself as black, other people may. And be wise when you're in certain situations. Be wise when you're in certain areas. When you're doing different things, keep that in mind. That, that's kind of been my experience personally. That's interesting because you say you don't see yourself as black. Do you think that society puts that um, point of emphasis on everybody to look at you as a black person as opposed to just being a person? I think there's a little bit of that. I think that it, it all depends on your experience. And I think that in some ways I've kind of taken that approach to other people and I just kind of see them as people. But that's just because like when I interact with other people, sometimes my goal is to kind of entertain myself. So when I visualize myself, I'm visualizing almost you could say like a cartoon character, just like, like a stick figure, like in terms of how I interact. So I do think that there is a bit, and that's kind of part of my struggle was seeing other people label me as black or pointing that out. And at the beginning, it was kind of like, it got on me a little bit because I didn't really see that. But the older I get, I accept the fact that like, I see myself as just Daniel, who is black, um, but if other people see that, cool. And if I can make a difference that way or be diversity in certain places or have a voice because I am that, then I'll go with it. How about you, Brandon? Brandon joining us via the phone. And so I uh, want to get yep. you in. Um, what the, let's start out with maybe a little bit of a, any type of racism that you might have experienced and then just go from there. Well, for me, um, I, I feel in a lot of ways, I feel like uh, similar to Daniel. Now, see, the difference is, is that one thing that I'll say is that every black person at, the, at a fundamental level is aware of the fact that they are black and that will create a fundamental difference between them and any other person that is not black. So when you talk about the subtlety of racism, it's something that we think about that is always in the back of our mind. Whether we have experienced it a lot or experienced it very little, it is something that we must always, or we feel at least up to this point, that we have always had to be aware of in a way that it could be used against us in a negative way. So with that being said, I'm, I did not experience also a whole lot of direct racism. I did have moments of indirect racism. There was only one particular, one particular time I remember I was with another friend of mine, and uh, we were black. Well, he was, he was black too, and we were coming out of a big lot, and we were racially profiled by the cops. And they said that uh, they got a report that two people were stealing out of the store and we weren't stealing. We had bought things and they were, they just, they profiled us and they didn't arrest us, but they basically, you know, told us that we had to, you know, that they thought it was us and they thought it was us and that we kind of had to just, you know, that we were loitering or that we were soliciting and we were saying we just, we literally came in and bought something. And that was one particular instance I can remember being profiled, and it was two white cops. It was a white man and a white woman. And they profiled us for no other reason than that we were black. So these are, that was an experience that um, I had. I didn't experience a lot of direct reasons. Mostly what I've encountered in my life is that, and I will admit that I have used this before, um, that people oftentimes feel guilty when they look at but they look at me and they see that I'm, I'm a black person and that, you know, there I usually will get, um, what I didn't realize for a long time, I would get sometimes backhanded compliments about being eloquent or being well-spoken. 
And I would realize that a lot of those comments were made because it was because of the color of my skin. Now, granted, I realized that after a certain period of time, everyone wasn't speaking like that. But just in general, um, being black is something that I've always been aware of, and it's something that my parents made me aware of. So, yeah, those are those are some of my experiences. We've got uh, Daniel West joining me here in studio in the uh, and on video. We got Brandon Wade joining us via the telephone. Uh, my name is Son Edom, and we all are coming together to talk about racism and getting a perspective of racism from these two young gentlemen. And one of the things, uh, Brandon, that you said was something about being well spoken. You know, both of you guys are educated. Both of you guys carry yourselves very well. You guys have uh, podcasts that you guys do, and so you are out there being accomplished. Has that been something that you guys have experienced that it's hard to get to that place of being accomplished because maybe the expectations of who you are based on the color of your skin, people think that you should not accomplish as much. Does that make sense? Uh, Dan, we'll start with you. Yeah, I haven't necessarily experienced that. I would say more it's kind of in the way that I do certain things or the path that I take. Um, for instance, you know, I was interested in sports, but it was more the broadcasting path as opposed to the playing path. You know, growing up, I hear a lot about, oh, you should be a basketball player because you're, you're tall. And I do enjoy basketball, but I enjoy announcing it more than playing. So it hasn't been so much expectation to where I am as opposed to kind of like the route I take or the, the place that I choose to kind of go in certain areas that's not as typical that I kind of come across a little more. And Brandon, for you, I know one of the things that stands uh, you out from everybody else, just e- anybody, it doesn't matter who it is, what color their skin is, is the way you dress. You dress very proper. You're always, yeah, yeah. You're always prepared, ready. What's your slogan? Stay ready so you're not going to get ready. Stay ready so you're going to get ready. So you come and you know, you're almost in a suit and tie uh, virtually every time we see you, so you're very well dressed. How about you? I mean, does the expectations of people when they see you and they see the things you've accomplished – do they kind of look at you and, and uh, take a double take and be like, wait a minute, how can this guy accomplish this, or are we past that? What I'll say is, for the most part, uh, I feel like in a lot of ways I've gotten past that, but it's not one of my benefits in anything else. Because what, what also aids me, and this is one side that we don't particularly talk about, because there is um, oppression in, the, in the, the things that we have experienced oppression, there's also a side benefit that people are usually always willing to more give you the benefit of the doubt, and they oftentimes want to be doing more for people that look like you. So when I come across somebody that is of a different skin color than me, and they may be a white person or somebody that is Caucasian or whatever, and they might see me, and they might see my level of success, they want to be attached to it because they want to say, amongst their people, amongst their friends, I'm supporting that black person. I like him because he's successful. It usually benefits me. So when I show up to an environment and I show up to a place and and I and, and I come off like this, either it, it, it will benefit me and people usually want to be seen giving me a healthy hand. And so I use that because I figure that until this, this, this thing balances out and we are coming at each other more on equal terms, I'm going to use whatever benefits me. And if it is the selfishness and guilt of somebody else, I'll use it. So, yeah, that's good. Typically, no, it doesn't really hurt me. It very much is something I use as my benefit. And so, Daniel, let's start with the problems we're facing today. Obviously, we're in a climate now where we had an incident happen in in Minnesota, and we don't need to get into that because I want to get past that um, because the the problem is ongoing. It's been going on for years. Where do you think the problem lies today when it comes to the issue of racism and people being racist and that whole topic that we're facing today? Yeah, I... I was talking with a friend of mine about this the other night, and I think what has happened and kind of changed is because the racism is a lot subtler than it was before, it's a lot harder to believe, and therefore there's a bit of a disconnect. So like Brandon was saying, you know, we we haven't experienced outward racism, but even as he was talking, I'm thinking back on, you know, situations where maybe we were followed in a grocery store or certain things that I don't necessarily think of as like, Oh, yeah, that was racism. But do other races experience that? Probably not. So I think that it's a lot easier when you're looking at, let's say, uh, a sign that says colors only or whites only. That's a drinking fountain or a restroom or a diner or places to sit. That's obvious. But when it's something more subtle, when it's, you know, profiling in a grocery store, whether it's uh, job opportunities, um, when it's stuff like that, it's a little bit harder 
to have people behind you saying, yeah, this is what it is, because you can make excuses and say, oh, this is so many other things. Well, what about this? And you can almost justify it away logically, and it's a lot harder to get behind than it is certain bigger issues. I think the hardest thing is people really listening to the concerns and the the cries of people who are saying, this is racism, this is what I'm experiencing, because it can kind of be passed off in a way it wasn't before. So I think that's the biggest thing is sometimes it takes something really big and obvious to open everyone's eyes and be like, okay, maybe everything isn't right. Brandon, how about you? Like Daniel said, at one point in this t- uh, in this country, there were separation of drinking fountains depending on the color of your skin, restaurants, bathrooms, all different kinds of things. We don't see that today, but we do see things happen, like you mentioned, being profiled by baby police officers because someone called in a report saying there are these two suspicious guys. And so obviously you guys maybe get profiled because of the color of your skin. What do you think the issue or the problem of racism lies today? I would say, honestly, and I matter of fact, I discussed this on uh, my podcast, Pay It Forward. Um, the issue is deeper than a skin issue. It's an identity issue. Um, I believe that um, even though this did not start out because of black people, because we were shipped from Africa over, over to uh, America by the whims of those that were in power looking for somebody to uh, do, bring over. So what happened is that over time it's been passed down to where there is an identity that both white people and black people have as oppressor and oppressed. And one of the things that um, I feel that a lot of white people have experienced is that they have in their identity, almost sometimes on a genetic level, the, uh, the feeling of being an oppressor. And sometimes I feel like that we also take um, take the sense of being oppressed. So there's an identity issue here that runs deeper because the question that I asked on my podcast was, what about the eventuality? Because I do believe this is going to be a reality that the oppression comes to a stop. That eventually, uh, that there's an, that there will be an even keel between black men and white men. What happens then? What will we do as a nation, as a people? when we're no longer able to identify with being oppressed? And what will they do as a people when they're no longer able to identify with being the oppressor? I think it goes far beyond and it's far deeper than something that is just a emotional issue or a skin issue. I think that there are people that have literally taken the own that say that the only thing that they even find in themselves of value is that they're able to oppress or that they are being oppressed. So I think it's an identity issue. Daniel's sitting here uh, nodding his head in agreement, and I think one of the things that is, is kind of interesting is that you have that hope. I think a lot of people don't have that hope that eventually, you know, like you said, we'll get past this, and then those that oppress will have nothing else to do. Those that were being oppressed, what do I do? Where do I find my identity? Do you think, so let me ask you this, and, and this uh, just came to mind yeah. as we were talking, uh, Brandon, do you think that people kind of stay in a state because that's all they know. For example, people might be racist because that's all they know how to do is be racist, or people might allow racism to happen because that's the only thing they know how to do um, because that's, that's what they've experienced. Do you think that's part of the problem? Absolutely. I think that it is 105% the reason, and, and a lot of it just simply becomes the fact that, and I, I will bring this up in a statement and then also bring it up as a question. Oftentimes, we have taken things as gospel truth simply because somebody that we trusted modeled it for us and told us that it was the gospel truth. There are many things that we have just accepted. You know, boys, big boys don't cry. Girls are girls should be princesses. Things that we just accepted because someone that we trusted and was in a position of authority and, and guaranteed our survival in life told us that that's what we need to believe to accept their love. How many racists are racist right now because they wouldn't be because their parents would not accept them if they were not racist? How many people that were oppressed are, are, are take accountability for being oppressed if they felt like, just because they felt like their parents would not be received? For example, and I'm not going to go too far into politics in this, um, I, I don't agree, I don't entirely agree with a lot of the things that Donald Trump said, but I don't think Donald Trump. 
but my dad despised Donald. And it was to a point that I felt unsafe to even disagree with him on even the slightest thing because he had a lot of generational trauma that told him that he should despise Donald Trump. And the reason that a lot of people do and think the way that they do is simply because somebody that they trust, somebody that was valued and told them that they must do that. So I can't count how many generations of racists have probably just been racist because that was the way that they grew up and grandpa told them and great-grandpa told them, and great-great-grandpa told great-grandpa. So there are a lot of things that once we look at them and we somebody goes like we're doing right now and ask the question, who said that and why did they say that? Do we actually look back and go, you know, I don't think, I don't even know why, why we even think that. So I do think that a lot of it is that people do it just because that's all they know. Daniel, one of the things, and we're joined, uh, by a couple of guys that are talking racism with me, Daniel West. He is the uh, host of the podcast, The Informal Program. And then on the phone joining us is Brandon Wade, and he is the host of the podcast, Pay It Forward. And I'm so hard trying not to call one Brandon West because you guys <laughs> come together with that W at the end. And so that's why I'm like thinking it through as I have to make sure I get it West because you guys are going to become Brandon West and Daniel Wade at some point. Um, but, but anyways, um, so, uh, so Daniel, based on that, um, you can drive by any elementary school playground mm-hmm. and you could see kids of all races mm-hmm. playing with each other you know and there's not a care in the world but then at some point maybe middle school maybe high school those same kids that were playing on that elementary school playground are now at odds with each other what do you think that comes from and how do you think we can maybe change that mm. i would say it's a bit of like an identity issue gone wrong because that's a a stage of life where you start to look at who am I? Who are others? And sometimes there, there are a lot of different reasons for it. Like, you know, it, it could be a matter of as you get older, as, as Brandon's saying, to be accepted in your own family, you're in your own culture. I'm going to distance myself from these people. It could be a case of this is who I am and I want people who look like me and that's who I want to be with. So I think there, there are several different reasons as to why that could be the case. But it definitely is a a mindset deal, partially, um, because, you know, my experience was internally, I I dealt with that a little bit. Like I said, that's probably the age where I started to kind of look at myself and look in other ways. But the people around me were different, and so I handled that a little bit differently. But if there are only black people around me, I might have handled it differently as well. So I think that kind of like who you're around at that stage and what you're being taught, whether you know it or subliminally, it gets passed down to you and it kind of stays with you. Did you, Daniel, come from a pretty diverse group of people surrounding you growing up, whether it be uh, friends you were around, people in the neighborhood, things like that? Was it pretty diverse? I did, yeah. Um, My dad grew up in L.A., South Central, and he eventually ended up coming to, to Pasadena in the area. I mean, long story about my mom and all that. But, you know, roughly we end up living in Pasadena as I grew up. I grew up going to black church the first six years of my life. Had all ethnicities, friends there. Ended up going to a more multi-ethnic church after that. So my whole life has kind of been uh, very diverse with the people I'm around. I do think, honestly, that has influenced my upbringing, the way that I look at things. Because I did go to a black church, but we had... Asian friends when we were there. We had white friends when we were there. So even then, I saw diversity, and I saw these are other people. In that case, these are God's people. We're all going to church together. And so I never had a problem with it. So from at a very early age, I saw the way my parents interacted with them, and it wasn't any different. And I think they made a point to instill that in me. So growing up, I didn't really see that. So I think that's why later on it kind of hit me a little bit more is because it never really had been an issue up to then. Brandon, how about you? What was your uh, growing up? Because you, uh, you're you still in the uh, inner city, and I've heard yeah. stories from you about your high school and the things that you've gone through. Uh, how, how was your diversity growing up, or were you primarily in a, in a black neighborhood? Well, I had, a, I had a very interesting experience with that. I've always uh, been located in the inner city, but my parents gave me a myriad of different experiences. Like, my dad was kind of like a street smart, street savvy person. If you'd ever spoken to him, you would never really guess that, you know, he was mostly a self-taught person. Uh, he was also very eloquent and things like that. Um, but they gave me a myriad of experiences. My dad would always want me to 
mingle with people that were, you know, of a high, of the, as he said, a high stature or wealthy or things like that. Like he always wanted me to be in those environments, but he also wanted me to experience what it was like, at least to an extent, being in the hood and being in the inner city. So I have gone to summer camps that were primarily full of Jewish people. I had one summer camp I went to for four or five years. It was one of the best experiences of my life. And it was a summer camp that was primarily Jewish kids, white kids, and Asian kids, and maybe a few black kids. Um, I, my middle school was, uh, uh, I went to John Burroughs in Beverly and, 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 uh, and, 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 and on the, the, um, the side of town by Wilshire. And it was a, it was a high class middle school. And so it was mostly Korean kids. There was, I mean, I can't count, tell you how many pages of pins we had in our yearbook. You know, it was like, you know, the majority of people were, it was 80 and 90% Asian. And then I went to my high school, which was like just straight gang day. You know, they were, in the hood, you know, you might know somebody one day and they might get shot the next day and you're just like, whoa, like it was, it was, I've had a myriad of different experiences. And then after high school and after some of the experiences I had there, when I came out to Pasadena, it wasn't entirely a culture shock because I was used to being in minority situations. Also, I've done acting, professional acting, but put me in a melding pot with a lot of different people from a lot of different cultures. And as a child actor, you just get used to accepting people as who they are. There was never really any preferential treatment based upon my race or not race. If there was anything that was going on, it could be significant. But really, there was no dis- dis- disregarding me based upon my race or anything like that, because if you were talented, they won. So, yeah, those are my experiences. We've got uh, Brandon Wade with us on the phone. Daniel West sitting next to me right here. And, and I guess uh, the conversation is talking about racism and, and, and just the idea of racism. And I guess as we look to the future, okay, we've got this big problem going on right now at the time of this taping. And, and it's all over the place. And every time something comes up, there tends to be uh, people go to the race card pretty quickly. You know, oh, you're racist because you say this or you're racist because you show that type of thing on your social media or you watch this type of program. So everything seems to go to the race card pretty quickly. And I think like Daniel said earlier, you know, it's, there's a lot of subtlety now to racism as opposed to the overt racism that this country once saw if we were going to try and address the issue okay thinking solutions um maybe not even on the on a on a national level but just in our communities how can we go about addressing daniel the idea of solving some of these racial issues that we have in our communities today I think start at the smallest level possible look at the people around you look who you're interacting with ask questions about that um Look at my circle. Can my circle change? How can I reach out? How can I be with other people who maybe aren't like me? And also listen to people. I think that's something that's really missed here is there's not a a, a sense of listening to what's the reason necessary behind that. I think some things get so political in some ways that everything, the baby is thrown out with the bathwater. That, oh, because this is a left-wing issue, this is a right-wing issue, suddenly it's, okay, that person's a Democrat, that person's a Republican, we can ignore them. But no, there is something behind that. Even if something is entwined with politics, there is a reason behind it, and there's a root reason. So get to that reason and kind of look past the political side of it and just look at the person and see what the person is. So I would just say immediately start with people you know. If you don't know someone, find someone. Just start asking questions. Just start listening. What is the reason behind that? Because I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced the more that I'm around people with all different beliefs and everything else that there is a legitimate reason why they feel that way, why they think that way. And so just ask questions about that. And you might find out, like Brandon said earlier, about people's upbringing. Maybe the reason why they have certain prejudices is because of the way they were brought up and because their parents said it. They never questioned it. And if you were to really examine, like, wait a minute, it falls apart. Um, The reason why people have experienced things is because of whatever. So I think that's that's the way. So start there. And once you have a group of people who are solidified in knowing who they are, interacting with other people and respect, then as you go to the higher levels, it's a lot easier because you look and you say, okay, these people are treating each other a certain way. How can we replicate that and we go forward? So I think, you know, not to, to, to minimize it or to, to go big, because, I mean, there, there's so much change we can make, but just start small 
And as you see more and more people who are unified, that becomes something to model. And then from there, it gets bigger. Yeah, like a uh, spark will start a fire, which will lead to a big wildfire that we know about here in California. Yeah. But, but it's kind of like that. You start yeah. something in your community, start something small. Maybe that starts a spark in the community, which grows to a larger community, to a city, and then you know from there. How about you, Brandon? What do you think uh, – could be some of the solutions as we move forward or some of the things that we can, what we can do to get over this issue. Honestly, I 100% agree with what Daniel said. I think that it should be at the most basic and small level possible. Um, I have a lot of friends. I've been blessed to have a lot of friends at different places. And like similar to Daniel, I pretty much look at people as people. I will remember the fact that that person might be able to get a break. They kind of acknowledge their culture or just be aware but I typically just look at people. people. Um, but I do have um, white friends that uh, have, have looked out for me in a lot of ways. And I can remember having a dialogue with one of them. He's probably done a lot of personal coaching with me and things like that um, through a lot of my emotional processes. And he was saying, you know, I, I just really wish I knew how to help you guys more, you know, how to help like more like, what do we do? Like, like these guys, yeah, protests, like, what do you do? Do you donate to things? And I say, what you do? is what you're doing right now. You found somebody that was interested in the work that you do and you're paying it forward into their life. Meaning you're giving me access to resources that I would not have or would have had a much harder time finding on my own, which empowers me to be able to help other people, which in turn empowers those people. And if you are going to be an ally or whatever, and whatever it is we are doing, we have to start with our community. I talk with my mom all the time. You know, I talk with... um the people that I know all the time. I post things on my, my, my page that directly deal with people there. Sometimes I get to respond to DMs where people are like, hey, I was feeling this. What do you think this is next? And I give them, I share resources with them. Say, hey, this is what I know. You know, I, or, or just even a simple, hey, I, I think that you do great work here. A compliment, um, a thought um, that, 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 that guides people. And it starts person by person step by step. It's not, I, I really think that a lot of, I know that a lot of um, Caucasian people have felt really, you know, empowered, like I want to get out and I want to protest. And that's understandable. And that's cool. But if you really want to protest the system, then you start with the person that's next to you. You help that person that's next to you that might not be in the position to have certain resources that you do. Maybe you go on their behalf and get something for them because it'll be more difficult for them to do it. Or maybe you, you know, do, you, you do like my friend did and you open up resources and stuff. That's how you step by step systematically change the system like this. Brandon Wade joining us via the telephone. He is the host of the podcast, Pay It Forward. Daniel West is sitting right next to me. He is the host of the informal program podcast. And, and I guess one of the things that's hard for me just in general, but I'll direct it specifically to the topic of racism and, and you know, black people, African-American people, is sometimes it's hard to understand because we sit there and, and it's kind of the concept of crying wolf, if this makes sense. You know, we, we're going to sit there and, and something happens, and so then the, the black person might automatically go to the race card, or it was racist, or every time something bad happens to a black person, it's a race thing. It's like a race uh, hate crime. You know, it's not, like a, it's not bad enough that's a crime, but now it's a hate crime. So it's all, everything's heightened, and then it gets to the point sometimes where I'm like, okay, is this, are we just exaggerating the point here? I mean, why does it have to be race all the time? Or, or is this person really just, you know, were they really speeding, but they're saying they got profiled, so they get pulled over. And so one of the things that I've had to do over time is, is adjust to, to the understanding that I can't really put my um, uh, impression or what my thinking is or my opinion into someone else's circumstances because I don't really know what that circumstance is, but I need to take a minute, pause, listen, and not necessarily sympathize, because I think sympathize, uh, sympathizing is kind of a, a bad thing, meaning like, okay, that person's weak and can't take care of themselves, and so therefore I need to be the solution. But, you know, you can kind of sit there and be like, okay, what is this person actually really going through, and what is it th about that situation that happened that could be corrected? Be 
because I think for me, that's, that's what it gets you because I always come from a point of logic and reason. And just to be straight and honest, sometimes I sit there and think, are we just crying wolf in this situation? Any response from any of you? Daniel, do you want to go first? Or? Yeah, I think that's where a couple of things we've discussed kind of come into play. A, the, the mindset aspect as far as when you're thinking, what is your default? So in my case, I don't necessarily always assume racism. I, I believe that it's there, clearly. Um, but that's not my default. So sometimes that's where I go. And the other thing, too, is what we were talking about earlier as far as the subtlety of it. And that's where everything gets kind of mixed in together. Because certain things may be someone's perception based on their mindset. Someone had good intent, but it's their perception. So it's kind of hard to weave through all that at times. So I think that's where the idea of kind of listening to what's behind it comes in. So that in this particular case, someone may have been speeding, yes, and they had a legitimate reason for being pulled over. But at the center of that is a concern that if I'm driving and I'm black, I may be pulled over for something that's not my fault. And that's kind of the overall arcing message. And that very well is probably a true thing that has happened to people. So I think that's kind of overall where I've kind of come to because there, there are some cases where I've looked at it and I've said, okay, you know, it, there's a lot going on here. I don't know about this, you know. So I think that's, that's the thing that I'm, I'm realizing more to kind of say to other people because that, that is a legitimate concern that people have is that is this really a case of racism? Is this whatever? But kind of what I've started to do is to be like, okay, what is the heart behind this? What is the concern, the fear, the pain behind what they're expressing? And even if it isn't true in this case, is there something to that that would cause them to think that way or cause them to say that that was created by this event? Yeah, so like you said, there could have been another situation where they got pulled over for no reason but driving while black. Right. And so now, even though this is legitimate, right. there was another reason. And so there could be two truths, is yeah. what you're saying yeah. to the story. There could be a truth where, uh, from a factual basis, there was, let's say, speeding, and so you get pulled over, and then... Nobody likes to get pulled over. Even I don't like getting pulled over. And so I, you know, when I get pulled over, I get upset and blame everybody else right. because I was the one speeding, but it's everybody else's fault. Yeah. But, uh, but then, too, there's also that truth where, um, yeah, because of past experiences, maybe this person truly does feel that this might be it. So right. there could be two truths, Brandon. So on what, I also, what I ultimately think is, too, I agree with you. I want to add on to what you said because, Again, I think it circles back to the issue of identity. See, after a certain point, it stops becoming, because identity, when we have identity issues, it skews, it can skew what the overall truth of the situation is. You could have had a cop that may have just saw somebody that they looked like was causing, causing harm, and a lot of cops may be pulling over, uh, people, uh, you know, for driving while black, and, but from their perspective, they may genuinely believe because that's what they were told and that's what grandpa said, that's what daddy always said, and maybe they saw one of their friends get beat up by a black person. And so when they see a black person speeding, they're like, that person is probably going to cause danger. So I, I can see this and that. And it, it, it could be genuinely motivated by something racism, but it's an identity issue that runs deep, especially for, I believe, people on our side of the point of black people, it runs deep. It's an identity issue. And we can oftentimes identify with being oppressed. And sometimes because we are, it causes there to be situations where it is kind of almost like a witch hunt. And witch hunts on either side aren't helpful to the overall cause. So I, I genuinely do think that it ultimately comes to an identity issue when it comes to down to people driving or, or to somebody being pulled over and, and not knowing what to do and then taking on that persona of I'm being pulled over because I am of this color. And they have accepted that about themselves, even though it may honestly not have anything to do with that. And so I think the more healing we do on our identity as African Americans, I think the more success we will be able to have in identifying what's really racist and what is. I'm joined with... Uh... Daniel West sitting to my side. He is the host of the informal program podcast and on the phone, Brandon Wade, the pay it 
Forward podcast host. And what would you guys say? And, and Daniel, we'll start with you. What would you say? Because now there's a lot of uh, people that are posting things on social media. For example, if you're white and you don't speak out, you're complicit. Or if you are this, if you're non-black and you don't do anything, then you know you're complicit and you're racist and you're this and you're that. How can we, is, is that legit, A? Eh? Is, that, is that something that we should be feeling? Or is that just peer pressure into us trying to do something? And then what can we do instead? Hmm. I would answer it this way. I would say, as far as what I'd say to them, I would say thank you. Because I think that people are aware that something's wrong. And they're saying in that way, we're trying to help. But I would also say, don't feel guilty if you yourself are not perpetrating but be aware of what you can do to help. So I appreciate the people speaking out. I appreciate people who are, in some cases, kind of third parties coming in and saying, hey, this is wrong, and I want to speak up, and I have a heart for that. That I appreciate. Um, and I don't want that to turn into feeling guilty because I was going about my life. Because like we've been talking about earlier, there are some people who – have a very diverse friend group, are speaking out in some ways. For them, you are not complicit if you don't say anything in this particular case because your character, your lifestyle, the way that you're interacting shows that that's not who you are. If you feel led on top of that to speak, absolutely go ahead and do that. But don't become guilty. Don't feel guilty because what I'm doing isn't enough in that way. So I would say to those people, continue to be yourselves. And if that is benefiting the community if it's fostering an atmosphere of, of of harmony when it comes to interact with different races go ahead and do that but don't feel guilty necessarily by osmosis because other people who look like you did other things so that would kind of be my thing is to, to going back to what you said about what we can do to help if you already are doing something thank you and if speaking out in that way helps good but don't feel obliged if you're someone who already is doing things and is living that kind of lifestyle. Don't feel because other people have done bad things. Yeah, I need to because there are some black people that have done things as well. And I don't put that on myself because they may look like me, but those crimes they committed, whatever they did in that case, that isn't on me. So I don't think that white people, other people shouldn't put that on themselves as well. I appreciate, you know, the understanding, the heritage and the legacy of what's happened, but let that go and live your life and change, be the change. Brandon, what about people that, let's say white people that want to speak out and want to say something and want to talk about the issue, but they're like white, this is their feeling. They feel they're white and they feel that they shouldn't because they're not in the know because they don't haven't experienced the same things that you you have experienced as a black person. What would you say to somebody that is white that doesn't know what to say how to say it, and doesn't feel like they are in a place to say anything because they are white. Matter of fact, um, I, I had a conversation that was similar to that. I had a friend of mine, um, you know, uh, her and I, she, she's white, but she she would be considered white, but she has to Armenian and, or, and something else. But um, she contacted me because I hadn't been on social media for a couple of days, and she contacted me and said, hey, you know, I, I you know, I, I, you know, I just wanted to make sure you were okay, and, you know, I, I hadn't heard from you, and, you know, I, I don't really know what to say in this situation, but I just want to let you know that I am here for you. And I think the, if, if you don't know what to say, um, I would say that to be forthright with your knowledge or lack of knowledge is, one, good, and, two, be willing to hold faith. Because sometimes it's not necessarily just about listening, but being able to hold space for somebody and their personal experience, which can be a very challenging thing sometimes because a lot of us live in our own head, live in our own mind. And most everything that people do to somebody else very rarely is personal, usually like a projection of some sort. And I just say if you can hold space for somebody and if you are willing to and you're interested in help, help in the way that it's most genuinely for you. Um, we oftentimes like to follow peer pressure ways. Well, we're not, well, we're to just move by what the crowd is doing, and we're not necessarily moved by what's in our heart, which is just like I was able to have that conversation with my friend, the coach, where I said, hey, the work that you're doing right now is the work that 
is 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 most potent because you're helping somebody that is asking for your help that is a person of color, and you're doing what works for you. So if somebody maybe wants to speak out and they want to say something about it, but they don't know what to say. All I would say is be open about your authenticity, where you are, what you don't know, and then be willing to hold space for someone as a friend, as a partner, as a patriot, somebody that can hold space for you can go a long way and can do more than a, a simple Instagram post, you want to say. Yeah, so it sounds like it really does go to a who you are, your character, your heart when it comes to dealing with somebody else, just being there. If even if you don't know what to say, just be there for someone and just let them know. And then see, just be aware that there is. Because for me, one of the, like I said, a lot of times I'll look at something through the prism of logic and reason. And for me, sometimes it's a little bit harder because emotion is there, but it doesn't play a whole lot uh, into it, if that makes sense. And I know a lot of times the topic of racism can be an emotional thing. And I just, and I just don't work that way. I'm not one that works off of emotion. Um, there's logic, there's reason. So, for example, if something comes up, I'm looking at the situation, and then I see it unfold, and then I'm making and formulating my opinions based on what the logic and reason behind everything says, basically like the facts and stuff. Yeah. So for someone like me, it might be a little bit harder to, to get that emotional side going because that's just not who I am. But it comes down to, it sounds like what you guys are saying, just understanding and knowing that each person is unique, each person is different, each person has their own experiences, and to kind of understand that. Just know that by you guys, you know, driving down the street, there could be the opportunity that depending on where you're at, wrong place, wrong time, you get pulled over or you get stopped just because of the color of your skin. Whereas someone like me, that might not happen. Um, and so it's just something that we need to do is to come, I guess, and just try to understand each other and maybe put ourselves in each other's shoes a little bit, both, both ways, really, it sounds like, because it sounds like, too, that, you know, sometimes maybe a person, you know, of another color, people of color, might need to understand that, you know, not all white people are the white privilege or not all white people are this or not all white people has a family heritage that goes back to, you know, slavery. And so there's an understanding that maybe we have to approach each person as an individual as opposed to just a blanket uh, stereotypical this is who you are and someone right. lump you in with everybody. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that because once mm -hmm. you start knowing people, then if something were to happen or as something happens, because you know their character, it puts things in a different light. So for instance, you know, nothing's going to happen to me, but if I were stopped by police, if something happened, people who know me, white people, black people, whoever, no, wait a minute, that's not Daniel. In that case, it would be a little bit easier for racism to possibly be something that brings up because they know who I am. They know the way I act and interact and the respect that I have. So it's like, okay, if something were to happen in that case, it might raise some red flags. But like, hey, something's kind of odd there because he's not the person who would. But if you don't know them and then you just see the facts that come out in a situation whether they're true or not, I'm not here to, you know, cast aspersions on that. But it's harder to because then you just have the plain facts, but you don't have the quantifiable part of who this person was, what this person would do, and was that out of character for them? And it goes for the other side, too, as far as police officers. You know, one thing that my mom used to do when I was young is say, go up to police officers and say, you know, thank you for all you do to protect and serve, just to say thank you for, you know, helping the community. And what that did is... It gave me a, a healthy respect to police officers, not a blind one in terms of I'm aware that things can go wrong. But between that and them teaching me certain things, it's like, how would I be if I'm around police? So that's something that I, I think about. How would I handle that situation? And so because I have met with police officers, my dad did some work, community work with some police officers, because I know, you know, some, somehow they're trained and all that. I would understand hmm, that behavior is an aberration from what I know, you know, in Pasadena in this case. Like, okay, I, I know some of these officers. I know that they're trained. So that's an aberration from that. Or people on my end or someone else's end saying, oh, that, that's an aberration from how they are. So once you know people, it opens up the opportunity to really understand how these events happen in a different light because you know the people behind them. Brandon, how about you? What say you on this? Well, um, I, 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 I do um, agree, like I said, I do actually kind of agree with um, Daniel on this. I, I would ask 
could you could you elaborate on the question you think? Because I was really pushing this with him. Could you elaborate one more time? Yeah. So basically, it was just kind of the the whole idea that you know we're talking each individual person instead of just lumping everybody into a stereotype. Okay, uh, white people oh, yeah. aren't speaking out, so therefore they must be racist, or yeah. or white people are this, and so therefore they're racist. Um, instead of just lumping people into stereotypes, does it really take us yeah. getting to look at each individual and each incident on its own merit and then making and forming opinions based on that? Yes. Yes. And I think that um, this is good because this, the, the younger generation, the thing about us as, as generations come, our generation, the generation after, we have the unique opportunity to change the narrative that has been going on uh, consistently through generations past. I am of the full book that much of this external stuff is not external, but in. And we have the opportunity to look at things from the lens of separate experiences based around merit and not just a white student belief system. My dad was always of the belief, he had certain beliefs that he just believed in wholeheartedly, and he generally just simply believed that this was always, if it was A, then it had to be B. If it's 2 plus 2, it was 4. And there was never going to be any other instance other than what he thought that it was going to be. And he was absolutely set in the belief about, oh, this happened because you were black, or this happened this and that. And the reality is, is that there are oftentimes many different nuances in situations. And we often, we, we, we play more of a role in creating the reality than we want, than we would like to admit. And we can take proactive steps in with proactive intent and we can do so person by person and step by step personally i've always been happy when cops have come on my block in street because everybody starts acting right uh my my street has suffered more in time not from cops but from just people just wilding out and acting crazy so when cops come on my street i'm usually happy and there's been many times i've come over you know to to, to cop and say, hey, thank y'all for being out here because now people are not going to run through the light signal at 80 miles an hour. You know, and I can feel safe walk crossing the street because they're not going to just run through a red light because they're trying to run from the gangbanger across the street. So, off the time, it's up to us as a, as a younger generation to change the narrative on what's going on. The only way we can do that is step by step. We've got about six minutes left, so just uh, as we kind of start to wrap things up, Daniel, any final thoughts or anything that you'd like to share uh, here in conclusion? Yeah, I would say um, as a Christian, the issue should really be looked at not so much as it can be looked at politically, but I think the question you have to ask, and this is also what guides me as well, is is this person created in the image of God, and we should treat each other that way. And so... When it comes to the church, because that's a whole different issue that we're not you know, discussing now, but when it comes to the church and when it comes to Christians speaking out and acting up, the real guiding motive should be, are we treating these people like God's children? And if not, take a look at that and what can we do to change that? Because that should be, that should be the end of it. It shouldn't be, well, but politically, what? no. Is there an issue with people being treated? Because sometimes it, it's a little harder when we see it in our backyard, when we look Across the world, it's a little bit easier to see, but when it's kind of like here, it becomes a little bit more muddled because we know the ins and outs and everything. But if something isn't right there, look and say, how can we make a difference? How can we change that? So that's kind of what guides me when I'm interacting, and that's just kind of my motivation to the people in the church is look at it beyond the political aspect. Just look at it from that. God created us all the same. We look a little bit different, but at the end of the day, we're all the same. And so... We're different. So when I say we're all the same, it's not as in I expect everyone to be the same. But at the end of the day, we are all God's children. And if it's easy for us to look at someone and say, hey, let's, then it should be just as easy here. And if something's wrong, then, then speak out in that. That's the way that you can feel comfortable. No matter what the issue is, no matter who brings it up politically on whatever side, that's the way that you can address it and be safe or comfortable or however as Christians. Because sometimes it's like, oh, I don't want to speak out on that. Is it a matter of treating people in a way that you would like to be treated. Love your neighbor as yourself. You can speak out on that. You can feel very comfortable speaking out on that. So I think that's what we need to do as Christians is look at it in that way and just leave it there. Brandon, final thoughts? Yeah. Um, again, um, I, in, 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 my own, in my perception of, 
a place. Um, one of the things that I thought was revealed to me about that kind of thing is it does come down to paying it forward. You know, my radio show is called Pay It Forward. Um, but it is specifically about paying it forward. Um, there have been times in my life where I have benefited from somebody that may have just taken a liking to me or may have just decided that they were going to help me and, you know, I might get up to the front of the line to pay for my stuff and they say, oh no, somebody already paid for it for it. And I'm like, and I may not even know who did it, but the person will say, you know, just pay it forward. You know, um, don't worry about who did it. Don't look to pay them back. And the benefit of paying something forward is that you, you ultimately are of the understanding that you'll never be able to pay back what was done for you. So you look for opportunities to pay it forward. And so just in general, I think that as people, you know, I don't think we should be as worried about big, giant, grand gestures. Those are cool, and those are important, you know, and we're, we're, we're always happy to see, you know, people that are out there protesting, saying, hey, we're really serious about this. But there's nothing that's better, at least in my opinion, than doing it one step at a time and finding somebody, you know, that might just have a little bit less encouragement, a little bit less than you do, and giving them access to something that they don't have. You know, it's not always um, a physical type of, of thing that you have to do, but it could just be a, a simple encouragement. It could just be a placement. You know, it could just be like, oh, I know somebody here, and I'm going to place them here. And I could be like, you know what? I can acknowledge the fact that you'll have a harder time getting here than me, so I'm going to make it easier for you. I'm going to balance the playing field. Oftentimes, that will go much farther than a grand gesture again on Instagram or something like that. So I'm just saying... The much as much as we can do, let's let's look at let's look at people as people. Let's try not to see everything as a generalization. Let's admit to the fact that racism is a thing, and let's do what we can to prepare ourselves for the eventuality that it won't be such a guiding factor in life anymore. Brandon Wade, Daniel West, thank you guys so much for joining me on this and uh, really appreciate your thoughts and your expressing your experiences and your perspectives on things and uh, just getting the conversation hopefully started on, on racism and, and everything that's going been, been going on in this country lately. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. It was a lot of fun. Let's just get, let's get it going from here. And for those of you watching and listening, thanks for listening. Do tell a friend. Let yourself be great. Take your passion. Make it happen. Be kind. Don't be an a-hole. And we'll see you next time.